Day to have a mother and a daughter up here singing. Amen. My Father's Day is in a month, so Paul, I expect you and your boys to have something for us, okay, on Father's Day. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, if you'd like, uh, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. It seems like about a month since we've uh, uh, been in the book of Galatians with having uh, the Blairs here and faith in action and other things. But we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 and starting towards the middle of that chapter, if you want to go ahead and turn there. About 20, um, when I was about 20 years old, I was attending Grand Rapids School of the Bible and Music. I was you know, getting my, my education, my training. And the very first year that I was there, uh, my parents had moved to Florida, and so on Christmas break, I went to my parents' house, um, and I stayed there for about two weeks. Well, that Sunday night, um, I decided to find a, a good Bible-believing church that was fairly close to the home, because I didn't have a car, I think I had to walk. Um, so, so I found this church, and I went into it to their Sunday evening service, and it was, it was actually a gymnasium-type building, they, they set chairs up, and it was as big as a, as, as a basketball you know, court, and there was, you know, hundreds of chairs set up, and there were about 25 people there totally, and, you know, they were all spread out amongst the whole uh, service, so obviously, I stood out. I mean, I was a visitor. I was the only visitor, probably, and so I sat there, and everyone was very friendly. So we sang our songs, and the pastor preached his message, and he came to the end of the service, and, and after, you know, the amen was given to his message, he, he invited us all to stand and to sing the song, Just As I Am. And it's a, it's a great salvation song, a plea to come to know Christ. And so we sang all four verses of Just As I Am. And in between each verse, the pastor was continuing to kind of implore if anyone needed to know Christ as their Savior, to come forward, you know, that they would pray with them. And verse after verse after verse, he, he, he continued to implore. And the song ended. And the pianist just kept playing the song, and while she was playing in the background, the pastor, you know, again, was, was talking about salvation and the, the need to accept Christ. Oh, really, really good stuff. And he finally gets to the end of what he has to say, and he says, let's sing that song again. And so we started singing Just As I Am, one more time. And as we're going through this, I'm beginning to realize that this is all for me. You know, I'm the visitor there. And the pastor, as he's imploring in between each song, he is more and more becoming very, very direct to me. Matter of fact, I, I begin to look around and people are looking. And, you know, there I am all by myself sitting there. And so we sang four more verses. Now we sang eight verses of Just As I Am. And once again, he, he, he spoke about salvation and need for Christ. And he said, let's sing the song again. And this time as we started singing verse 9 and, and verse 10 and repeating the song, people were looking at me and, and some were pleading, please go forward so, so we can go home, you know. We can be here all night doing this. I'm not sure about that. So we started the whole song again. And after the 10th time, the 10th verse that we sang, Just As I Am, halfway through that, a man came up from behind me and approached me. And suddenly I heard him say, son, if you were to die tonight, do you know whether or not you would go to heaven or hell? And then I turned to him and I said, well, yes, I'm a Christian. You know, I told him I was on winter break from you know, going to Grand Rapids School of Bible because my parents lived down there. And then he said something that I have never forgotten. He said, we thought so. He said, you look like a Christian. I was so stunned by what he said. I mean, I was speechless. I look like a Christian. I mean, did I, was I glowing? Did, did I have a halo, you know, miraculously appearing? You know, did I have my re regenerate body? I mean, maybe when I walked, was I levitating just a little bit? I mean, what was it that made that, that I looked like a Christian? Now contrast that. To about three years ago, um, my wife and I went once again down to Florida. We flew actually down there for vacation, just Martha and I. And we stayed, the very first night we were there, we stayed at this elderly lady's house um, through a ministry called Mennonite Your Way. And some of you have stayed with that and you're, you're familiar with that. It's a hospitality uh, ministry. And matter of fact, from the airport, this elderly lady and her, I believe it was her brother, picked us up from the airport and took us 
back to her house for the first night. And she told us that the next morning, and I've shared this with some, we, I've shared this in a number of different contexts, but she told us the next morning that she was going to be having a Bible study in her home, and that they would be gathering just about the same time that we were going to be leaving. And so in my mind, I'm picturing, you know, this little old lady that's going to have a Bible study, and it's going to be just these wonderful elderly couples that are going to be together, and they're going to be studying the Word of God. So I had this picture in my mind. Well, it was anything but. As the woman, women the next day began filing into her home, our host stood by us and gave us a quick background of all of these women as they came in. A lady came in, and, and she was an older lady. She said, that woman is Jewish. Her husband just died, and she just started coming just a few months ago. And then there was this tall, slender, beautiful yoga instructor came in. And then behind her was this, this young lady in her mid-twenties, tattooed, covered all over her body, all over her uh, arms. And she whispered to us, she goes, a few years ago she was living in a cardboard box on the street. And as each new woman came in, I mean, it was unbelievable. The women would greet each other. I mean, they'd squeal to see them in excitement. It didn't matter if, if they were their same age or their same, uh, you know, financial break. It didn't matter what little bit. I mean, you just, you felt Christ in that room. Young and old, tall and short, rich or poor. And Mark and I both remember thinking at that moment, this, this is what Christianity looks like. This is what Christianity is about. And my point of these two stories is this. Our faith, our faith is not a matter of dressing a certain way. It's not about adopting a certain look or showing up, you know, at the building at, at just the right times. But God is concerned that we have a tendency, our human nature is to draw back to the external things, to what we look like, our perception. Matter of fact, that's what so much of the book of Galatians has been about. You remember back in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, we put these verses up. It says, but now you have come to, you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How is it that you turn again to the weak and worthless elementary things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. He also said earlier in Galatians chapter 3 verse 3, I mean very pointedly he says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? I mean if salvation is in a heart situation, where, where God redeems us, regenerates us, gives us the Holy Spirit within us, if we start that way, why are we suddenly focusing on all of the externals? And this has really been Paul's focus throughout the whole book of Galatians. He's been talking about the law, the do's and don'ts, versus grace, the work of Jesus Christ. He's been talking about freedom in Christ versus the bondage of the law. Now we're coming kind of to the end of the, the book, this letter that Paul has written to the Galatian church, and an obvious question has to arise, and, and Paul's going to address this. Um, you know, I mean, as a Christian, if we all have this freedom that I am no longer under the law, if it's all about grace, if I have all this freedom, if the law, which laid out all the do's and don'ts, if it only serves to kind of lead me to my inability to be good enough, thus my need for Christ. If that's what it's all about, then, you know, if it's no longer our tutor, does this mean that I'm free to do whatever I want? You know, does it mean that as a Christian we have freedom in Christ, that we don't have the consequences, you know, for our actions? Are there, are there not the do's and don'ts? Well, he's going to answer that in this last part of chapter 5. First of all, he starts out in verse 13, if you want to just... Uh, we're not going to start 13, we'll start verse 16. But he says, For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another.
You see, the point of Galatians is to remind us that the law could only change the outside person. It could only change what we look like. It could only change our external actions. And the law could go only so far because for a while we can do it. We can be right. But ultimately our nature draws us back. And we, we fail miserably on our own. We can't stand. We know that Christianity, though, is a heart issue. Christianity is something that happens within. It works from the inside out. But our draw is to, once we're saved, is to constantly go back to this checklist. Because it's easier to look the part. It is easier to look like a Christian than to be transformed into a Christian. Well, the means by which God accomplishes this transformation is what we're going to be focusing on today. He's going to be talking to us about the Holy Spirit. You see, if you're a Christian today, if you're a genuine believer, you know, not just in name or, you know, in association, but if you are truly a child of God, every single believer has been given the Holy Spirit to live within their life, live within their heart. It's one of the signs, us having the Holy Spirit working within us, it's one of the signs that we're truly God's children. We're told that the Holy Spirit is given as a seal of our redemption. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Christ said this, He says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but when I go, I will send him to you. So he promises the Holy Spirit that when Christ leaves, I mean, they were wondering, wait a minute, Christ is going to die, he's going to go back to heaven? What are we going to do? He says, it's better for you that I go. You know, I'm here. He had, he had limited himself to a physical body. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to live within you, to be with you constantly. And we need to understand the Holy Spirit, it's not given to the world, it's only given to Christians. It's not given to the world. In John 14, verse 17, he says, that is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him that does not see him or know him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you so we have something that the world doesn't have an unbeliever doesn't have an unbeliever still has the law on him I mean still has those do's and don'ts and it still has that tutor because it's supposed to get us to the place to realize I can't be good enough I can't do this myself. That's my need for Christ. But once the person is genuinely saved, no longer is it the, the law that is our tutor, but we are given the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to grasp today is that sin doesn't run wild when you take away the law. For a Christian, because the Spirit is, is there within us. So in other words, you can have holiness in your life without having legalism. Because that's what adhering to the law was, legalism. But the Holy Spirit works within our heart. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to ask, we're going to read our, our text in Galatians uh, chapter 15. We're going to start in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to ask you to stand together with me, if you would, um, as we read God's Word. It says in verse 16, But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For they are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you. For I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, 
Let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. All right, you can go ahead and be seated. Well, that's a lot to cover here, so we're not going to cover it all today. We're actually going to take the first part today, and next week we're going to go ahead and finish this up. But we want to start in verse 16. It tells us, but I say walk by the Spirit. So you got to ask yourself, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Now, there's a lot, a lot of denominations, believers out there who have their idea of what this is. Matter of fact, in the 1800s, there was the quietest movement that they defined walking by the Spirit as simply surrender. It was all about surrendering to the Holy Spirit. It didn't involve any effort on their part, only surrendering. Uh, groups like the Quakers were, were quietists, and that's what they focused on. They also taught that there was a second work of grace. The first work of grace is to save us. But they said then that there was a second work of grace, that once you become so surrendered to the Holy Spirit, that the sin nature within you would be eradicated, that it would be removed. And they believed that you could come to a place of, of being sinlessly perfect. And if you think about that, yeah, you know, that sounds extreme, but even today, if you think about it, probably if you're a believer, most of your interaction with the Holy Spirit is in the area of surrendering, giving in, doing what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. Certainly, that is part of it. But that is so incomplete to what it means to walk by the Spirit. Matter of fact, the Greek word for the word walk used here is, is persepatil. It means to be occupied by the Holy Spirit. I want you to be occupied by the Holy Spirit. But it, it's beautiful that they use that word walk because we understand that. Now, we, we as a family, uh, my family, we walk a lot. And we walk up and down the school road, you know, sometimes two, three, four times a week we go up and down the school road. And, and, and if you go for walks with people, you soon learn that everybody has a different pace in what they're walking. We tease Martha because she has a cougar walk. And she takes off, you know. And then when Rebecca is with us, Rebecca's a mosey. You know, you know, no matter how fast or slow we walk, she's 50 yards behind us. You know, and she's just going along. They well now. You know, when you go for a walk by yourself, it really doesn't matter, you know, what your pace is. You get to set the pace. I'm walking by myself. I set the agenda. I set what direction I'm going to go. I, I set the, the length of time I'm going to go, when I can start, how fast I have to go. But when you walk with someone else, particularly if they're in charge of the walk, it's all about matching their stride, isn't it? It's all about keeping up with them or, or not getting too far ahead of them. And this involves more than just surrendering or deciding to follow the Holy Spirit. Because we're told in verse 17 here, it says the flesh, that's our human nature, the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh for they are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. I mean, there is literally a battle taking place. There is a war taking place. I mean, maybe the best description of it is you're on this walk with the Holy Spirit and the flesh is setting up this, this obstacle course in front of you to try to get you out of step with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you're, you're trying to walk led by the Holy Spirit, but man, along comes the flesh. And it's constantly trying to trip you up. It attacks you, it accuses you, it tempts you, it distracts you. You know, it's like walking along the street and there's potholes and puddles and your shoe comes untied, so you got to bend over and tie it and you're getting fatigued and tired. The next thing you know, the person you're walking with is way ahead of you. You know, you're not walking in step with them. I mean, think of it like this. It's like when you want to walk in purity of mind. Okay, we have many scriptures that tell us to have pure minds. And uh, remember what it says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any ex 
excellence and anything worthy of praise dwell on these things. And so if you want to be a good Christian and God places this verse on your heart. He says, I want to do this. You know, I want to have a purity in my mind. I want to be thinking about the right things. And so you're walking along with the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you've surrendered. You say, God, you know, Spirit, I want you to do this in me. I want you to help me to do this. And so you're walking along with the Holy Spirit, thinking about pure thoughts. But what happens in your everyday life? If you work on a computer, a pop-up comes on. An impure pop-up. If you watch TV, even if it's a good show, the commercial comes on. And it's not pure. You drive along the road and there are billboards. You can't miss them. They're giant billboards advertising impure things. You watch the news and there's an attitude, you know, that is being permeated out from the news. Now, it's not just a matter at that point of surrendering, but it's a matter of doing battle. The Holy Spirit doing battle with the flesh. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, and then verse 19, remember, remember Paul talked about this inward battle he has? He says, For what I am doing, I don't understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. For the good that I want, I do not do, but the, I practice the very evil that I don't want to do. See, it wasn't just a matter of surrendering, because you can surrender, you know, it's the idea of giving in to the Holy Spirit, but the flesh never stops. Your flesh never stops attacking you, trying to draw you back, trying to discourage you, trying to get you out of step with the Holy Spirit. And depending on the degree that you give in to the flesh, suddenly you find that your walk with God, your walk with the Holy Spirit, it's separated. And you don't just surrender. Because the flesh is always going to be there attacking, kneeling. Now the flesh is going to be there accusing you. See, getting back in step with God, you're going to need to surrender, yes. But there's so much more than that. There's going to need to be confession. There's going to need to be repentance. You may need to take physical steps in your life to avoid these distractions. There's the things to dwell on, to put your mind upon God's word and, and prayer that, that keep your mind pure. See, it's not just about abandoning. But it's also about doing battle. And this isn't just in the negative sense, you know, that the Holy Spirit is there and we need to walk with Him, you know, and that we're being attacked by these negative things. I mean, think about it. You're, you're, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be walking along with the Holy Spirit. You're keeping in stride with Him. What if the Holy Spirit wants you to pick up your pace in your Christian walk? What if the Holy Spirit wants to take you a different direction? Take you down a new path? That, that you've never gone before. You see, walking with the Spirit, staying in step with the Spirit, it's just not a matter of surrendering, but of occupying your life with what God wants and seeking Him and, and, and making those steps necessary to battle the flesh. The, the flesh is going to battle you all the way with busyness and priorities and, and selfishness. Are you walking by the Spirit? It's, it's more than just surrendering. Now I want to real quick, uh, for the time we have, I want, to, I want to look at the opposite of walking in the Spirit for a second. And then we're going to, next week we're going to talk about you know, the fruits of the Spirit. But in verse 19 it says this. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. And then it goes and begins to list all these deeds. The deeds of the flesh are evident. That is similar to to that phrase in verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the result of the Spirit, or the result of the flesh, this could be saying. And this is an important distinction to make, that these are fruits, these are deeds of the flesh. They are not the root. They may appear to be your problem, they may appear to be my problem, but my problem is the root. It's not necessarily the fruit. All of these things that he's going to list here, the deeds of the flesh. They're all indicators to us as to who we are walking in step with. Are we, are we having the deeds of the Holy Spirit or the deeds of the flesh? Who are we in step with in our life? That's the question here. 
And again, it's an important because, you know, most believers, you know, and I do this as well, we, we make the mistake of attacking the fruit. I need to, I need to go after this, this area in my life that I'm struggling with, this sinful area in my life. Whether it's impurity, or jealousy, or envy, or strife, anything that's named here. And we tend to, you know, as a Christian, I want to stop that. I need, I need to do battle with this. And so we attack it in the flesh. And, but again, that, that's like battling with the law. We do battle with the externals. And ultimately we will fail. Because it doesn't change our heart. As a matter of fact, even the fruit of the Spirit, even the fruit of the Spirit is not an external battle. It's an internal heart decision. You cannot decide as a Christian, you read this, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Okay, I'm going to become more loving. And so, so I'm going to be, start doing more actions of, of showing people, you know, that I love them, that I care for them. You can do that for a while. But again, remember that flesh that is going to constantly be battling you on this? And eventually the bat, they're going to wear you away. And you're going to be looking down a few weeks down the line and you're going to be no cha change whatsoever. Because you cannot become more loving without a heart change. It comes from the root, the fruit. You cannot become more joyful or more self-controlled unless your heart changes. That is what he's trying to get at. To try to do this, these you know, fruits of the Spirit, to try to do them without the Holy Spirit, you know, inwardly, working. That's exactly what Judaism did. You know, they were living the law and, and they, they parsed it down to, you know, every little nuance of do's and don'ts and that they couldn't and it was all external. And they, they failed miserably at it. Now verse 19 through 20, let's, let's talk about these deeds of the flesh real quickly here. It says, now excuse me, Verse 19. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, there's disputes, there's dissensions, there's factions, there's envy and drunkenness and carousing, and things like these of which I forewarned you. And I have forewarned you. Again, these are the results. He's talking here. These are the fruit of a heart that is following after the flesh. They are a thermometer to tell us if we are getting off of course. If I'm finding these things in my life and that they're surfacing, it's because my heart. My heart is not walking with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's, there's a number of categories, and I'm not going to look at each individual one here, but... The, they can categorize these, these external things that come out. He talks about sexual sins. He's talked about divisive sins that, that divide us. There's attitudinal sins listed here. There's sins of indulgence. And then he makes that statement in verse 21. After listing all of these sins, he says, and things like these. In other words, it pretty much covers everything. Sin. It's a fruit. It comes from a heart. That's where, that's where it draws its strength and its energy to grow. Now verse 21, the last part of it. He says, Just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, these are the fruits. These are the results of a heart that is followed after the flesh. They are a thermometer to tell us if we're getting off a course. Now you might say, well, wait a minute here. We all have these things. I've been jealous before. We all have impure thoughts. We've all used our tongue to cause division. If I practice these things, is this really saying that I am not going to enter the kingdom of God? Well, the key word there is that word practice. In the Greek, it means a continual pursuit. It's not that a believer doesn't sin in this area, but in the case of unrepentant, 
habitual sin, it is an indicator of where our heart truly is. That, and for many, if you're habitually, you're not repentant, moving, I'm fine with it. It's an indicator that we are not believers in Christ. And this is going to kind of bring me to my conclusion, kind of my application here. Uh, two things I want to talk to you about here, and then, and then we're going to end here. I really want you to examine your heart today. What is being produced in your life? What's, what's, what's coming out here? Whatever's coming out here, it, it started from in here. And I specifically want to talk here to those of you who have been part of the church, not necessarily this church, but any church, that you've been around Christianity for such a long time. You know, it's easy for you to look the part. That's the easy part. But Christianity is a heart issue. And so one of my challenges today is for us to look at our life, and no matter how long that, that we have been going to church, to really step back and ask the question, by my life, by what's coming out of my life, am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? I mean, some of you might have been just raised in the church. That's just how you've always been. It's, it's just been there for you. And these truths and these facts and heaven, eternity and Christ and the cross and forgiveness and, you know. But maybe you haven't really accepted these things within your heart. I remember at Grand Rapids School of Bible and Music, uh, one year that I was there, they had an RA. She was in charge of one of the, the, the dorms. She got saved that year. She'd realize that, you know, that she'd never really embraced it for herself. Well, if you're looking at, at these fruits of the flesh, if you're looking at these things, you know, this is where my life is producing, and, and you know, I'm not really repentant. You know, I'm okay with these things. If God's speaking to you today, I say, you got a heart, you know, it's not about looking. You may look the part. But the question is, is the Holy Spirit living with so it's not to be that we know God, but that we are known by God. And today can be that day. I mean, that's why we talk about this. We're not, to, we're not looking to shame anybody. We're all sinners. We are all fallen. What we are looking to do is to make sure that nobody gets to the gates and cries, Lord, Lord. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. And then we're, what, what do we mean? You know, I went to church my whole life. Because it's a heart issue. That's what it means. I just want you to examine your heart today. Are you sure you're a Christian? Again, we're given a thermometer here to indicate what's in our heart by what's coming out. The second thing I want to talk about, once again, to, to children of God here, those of you who are genuinely saved, when was the last time you did a spiritual heart check? I mean, it's easy to get saved and become a Christian, and then we just kind of go along and we move along. But when was the last time that we, we stepped back and and looked at the deeds of our heart. What, what, what is my life really producing? What is my, my mind, my thought life, my, my tongue? What am I really producing? You know, I was looking at this this past weekend. And God just brought to my mind James chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Remember what it says there? It says, from the same mouth come both blessings and cursings. My brother, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh water and bitter water? And sometimes we can get to, to be like that as a Christian. I mean, we're trying to walk in the Spirit in some areas, but in other areas we're producing fruits of the flesh. And we seem to be okay with this. To be a fountain that spews both salt water and, and we have fresh water giving out there. Those areas where we see fruit that is the flesh, you know, we, we've just become comfortable with it. You know, we're saved and, you know, this, this is what my life is down to. We need a spiritual heart check. I mean, think about this. If you knew today, if you went to the doctor and you knew that you had a blocked artery or, or a defective valve, wouldn't you want to fix it? Wouldn't you want to get it straightened out? You don't say, well, I have other valves. <laughs> you know, I have, I have other arteries, they're working. You know, as a believer, you know, it says these things ought not to be. 
Our goal, our desire, our heart is to look to the, the Holy Spirit to within to change us, to redeem us, to change our outward actions. And we should constantly be doing a heart check. I mean, have I let these things slip in my life? And it's got to bring those things to our mind. Again, we need to surrender. We need to repent. We need to confess. We need to ask forgiveness. And then, you know, things that have been going on for a long time that have become habitual in our lives, you know, we need to take actions of them to develop those different habits. Now, I'm going to ask Michael um, if she'll come forward. We're going to close the service just a little bit differently. Um, we're going we're to do give you a an opportunity, a chance to do a spiritual heart check. To just quietly sit before God. Don't, don't worry about anybody else. Just talk to God about yourself, about your own heart. What's your life producing? What's your thought life producing? What's your attitudes producing? What's your tongue producing? And as God shows you those things, let's do business with God. This is our chance right now. So Martha's, Michael's going to play for us. I'm just going to give us, I'm going to give us a couple minutes here just to quite that. You know, if you want to come forward and pray, you're, you're more than welcome to. But I, I want you all to be involved, just not anyone who would come forward, but to be sitting there and to be focusing on God, focusing on your heart. Let's pray again. Father, I just want to thank you for your word that slows me down and challenges me. And what you've done, you've really challenged my heart today. You give me a chance to look at my life and Father, not just to settle in my faith with you. those things that you have pointed out to us as believers, Lord, that you know, here is we need to work on to change the root, not just attack the actions, but to change our hearts. Father, we lay those things before you right now and lead us in the steps that we need to take to battle the flesh that will want to draw us back into this. Let us make it a matter of prayer, a matter of being in your word. Lead us and guide us each step of the way, fathers, as we get back and step with you in, in these areas. And Father, I pray for any here that if they've looked at their life, Father, you know, they, they're not sure whether or not that they are believers in Christ. You know, Christian in name, but maybe not in heart. And I thank you for this day that in your word, Lord, that, that draws us up short because you love us. You want us to know where we stand with you or away from you so that we can come to you and truly be saved. And so I pray, Father, for any heart that is reaching out to you that says, right now, Father, I 
accept you as my Lord and Savior. I confess myself a sinner in need of your Son to die on the cross to pay the debt for my sin. God, I give my life, my heart to you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Father, for your eyes.